Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Hey, I'm Joel. We're going to continue our series today called The Circle Perspective, where we have been talking about this fact. God is always working in your life. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The call that God has placed in you, the specific giftings and talents he placed in you, there is a call and a specific purpose for those. And there's a specific reason he put those things in you. And then he put you on earth at this time in history. But we have to recognize, like, like, like we talked last week, that, that oftentimes the path to getting where what God wants us to go, it, it, it starts out from this place of living in fear. But he takes us and he, and he starts to expand out who we are. And that's why you find yourself sometimes coming back to similar themes in your life, maybe similar time frames. Like I know for Emily and me, it's like, it's like a three-year time frames. Every three years, something changes in our life. And for you, maybe every, uh, the seasons have been different year time patterns with these circles, these patterns we keep coming back to. And when we're in the middle of, of pain and the difficulty and challenges of life, one of the things, the most important things we can do is lift our perspective and realize, hold up. I don't know what God's doing here, but I know this for sure. He hasn't forgotten me. He hasn't abandoned me. And your pain, when you're in the middle of it, as we talked last week, we said it's not wise when you're in the middle of your pain to start asking why, because you'll come up with really messed up answers. The best, an- the best thing to do when you're in the middle of pain is to say, okay, what am I going to do about this? And the, the way you respond to pain will either determine whether your pain points to your destiny or whether it points to despair. And your destiny is where God, where we believe that God says all things work together for the good of those who love him, for those who are called, there's that word called again, according to his purpose. And if you're sitting here this morning and you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you've been called. If you're here this morning, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you've been called also. And we're going to talk about that first step. So we're going to look at that call this morning, because at some point in our life, we all come to a place where we have a call that becomes really clear. Last week, I talked about when we moved uh, to Mexico and how I was not super excited about moving to Mexico, but we ended up saying yes. We moved to Acapulco, Mexico, the most dangerous part of Acapulco. We lived in like the ghetto. And when I went down there, I thought, okay, man, I'm going to be a missionary. I'm going to lead all these drug dealers to Jesus. I'm going to be a great missionary. Well, I got down there and by like the first day we were there, our freezer broke. And I was like, oh, this is an annoyance. So it was really hot where we lived in Mexico. So I was like, we got to get this freezer fixed. So I called the guy that had left the ministry to us. And he, I said, hey, Dave, uh, the freezer broke. Who do I call to come fix it? And he laughed. He's like, bro, nobody's going to go out to the ghetto where you live to fix anything. You got to fix it. I said, Dave, I, I'm not here to fix things, man. I'm a missionary. <laughs> it's kind of ironic even saying that. Anyway. He said, well, you got to fix it, bro. Nobody will fix it. I'm like, I don't know how to fix a freezer. He's like, sure, just take the thing apart and you'll figure it out. Like, take the thing apart. He's like, no, Dave, that's ridiculous. I'll ruin the refrigerator. He's like, no, well, the ruin's not, it's not working anyways. Take it apart. And I was like, finally, I kind of got frustrated. I hung up the phone and I called a a pastor friend of mine named Pastor Max. And I was like, Pastor Max, necesito tu ayuda. And he's like, all right, come on. So he comes over and he he starts taking, he grabs a, a, a screwdriver and just starts taking the refrigerator apart. And I'm like, have you ever done anything like this? But he's like, no, pero no hay problema. He's like, there's no problem. We'll figure it out. I'm like, oh my gosh, her freezer's never going to be the same again. Well, anyways, we take the panel off and we see this broken thing that's all frozen over. And he's like, I think that's it. I'm like, what is that? I don't know. Well, we took it down to the store. We're like, we need one of these. Necesitamos esto. And he's like, okay. And so they gave us esto and then we took it back. And we fixed the freezer. And I was like, yeah. Well, that was cool, right? Except every day something else broke. And I found myself every morning going, oh God, what's going to break today? It's a water pump, a hot water heater. We had a, a, a drain field for a sewer backup. That was fun. And every time I called Dave, I'm like, who can I get to fix it? He's like, you're talking to him. I'm like, so after about three months of this, I'm just getting frustrated. I'm like, I didn't come down here to fix stuff. It's like, I've got more in me than this, than just fixing stuff. And it was right in the middle of that, that I really felt like God, God had been telling me for years to write, but I had never done it. I was too busy doing all sorts of other stuff. And in that, through that process, actually, of, of kind of sitting there doing this manual labor, I thought I was going to be there leading people to Christ instead of like repairing stuff all day long. Uh, I, I remember thinking, 
there's more in me than this. And it kind of, the, the discomfort of, of that work pushed me to get into writing. And that's where my writing career started, while digging out sewers in Acapulco, Mexico. Now, here's the thing I know about everybody in this room, okay? Every one of you, at some point in your life, if probably right now, you've said something like this to yourself. I just know there's more in me. You may be digging ditches right now and you're like, man, I know there's more in me. There's nothing wrong with digging ditches. A very great, noble job. You may be out working, working, fixing cars, but you're saying, man, I know there's more in me than this. And I think it, it, there, there's something within all of us that says there's something more. I just know it. And you know, maybe you're out doing self-destructive things. You've had a lot of pain in your life and you're using alcohol or drugs to, to, to calm that pain. But even while you're doing it, you're kind of thinking in your mind, you're like, I'm better than this. I know there's more in me than this. But yet the pain's so much and you're just like, but I don't know what it could possibly be because you don't feel good about yourself. And so you just use the drugs or the alcohol to numb the pain, but still inside of you, you feel kind of afterwards, you feel weak and you feel dirty and you're like, man, I'm better than this. I know there's more in me than this. Maybe you're not struggling with drugs, but maybe you're at a season of your life where you've, you've done really well and you've got a great family and you love your family. You've got a great house. You've got a decent job, but you still find yourself going, I just know there's more in me than this. And maybe you find yourself on, on the line looking into culinary school or maybe going back to college or looking into career fields. Maybe you want to start a taco truck or something. Like there's something in you that just says, I know there's more. Maybe you're down in the stage of life where you're looking back and going, man, I have really screwed some things up in my life and it's too late for me. But yet there's still this voice in your head that goes, no, there's still something more in you. There's a drive within every one of us that says there's something more in you. If you're doing really dumb things and messing up your life, you still know you've got more in you. If you've got life, as you sure like some of you, some of us, we feel guilty. We're like, well, I should be content with where I'm at. I've got a good life, but why do I still feel like there's more that I've got to give? Or maybe you're in those, you know, third stage of life here and you're going, man, I still, I, I still feel like, man, I can't move quite as well and I don't have quite as much energy I have, but I know there's more in me. And we've all got this call in us. And here's the thing, that call is straight from God. In fact, there's this verse that I love. It says this, it says, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. That means he never takes them back. He put those gifts and talents and abilities in you when you were born and he's never taken them back. And that's the cool thing about it because you may say, well, I, I've just messed up, messed up life. Yeah, but the call is still there and it's not too late to pursue that call. This is why, this is the fascinating thing about this. You'll see people that are I, we've seen a lot of preachers that have fallen this year into moral failures. And you go, why would God bless that? Why would God bless that? But here's the thing about it. God put a gift and a call in them and he doesn't call it back. The question is, what are you gonna do with that call? Are you gonna use it for good? Or are you gonna be self-destructive with it or just destroy others? I, I worked directly for a pastor for a long time. He had some major moral issues we didn't know about. And the guy could build churches. He built this 5,000 strong member church and then he fell. He cheated, cheated on his wife with one of the members of the congregation. He got restored, got another church, built the church up again, screwed it up again. And it's like, what is the deal with this guy? He had a gift. God put a gift in him to build churches and God doesn't ever call the call back. But the question is, what are you gonna do with it? And there's some stuff in you that, man, you may have made the, the most dumb decisions in your life up to this point. Your life has been a series of failure, but the call hasn't gone away. And maybe, here, maybe for you, you've had the call and you've been feeling it, but you've just been really, really afraid. We're gonna talk about that today because here's the thing. When the call is in you, the call is to live for something more than your own security, your own relationships with others, and your own sense of control. We talked about that last week. We all start from a place of, of living out of fear of not getting three basic needs met. We all want security, financial security, emotional security, relational security. We all want connection with others. We want to feel valued, loved, accepted, esteemed. And we all want to sense that we have some control over our lives. But here's the thing that Jesus says. He says, listen, guys, I know you need all those things. I made you to need those things, but I made you to get those things met from my love. Your spouse, never going to be able to give you the security connection and control you're looking for. Your 401k, never going to do it. Your savings, your job, whatever it is, 
never gonna be able to give it to you. Your kids, on their best day, they can't give that to you. So you gotta stop looking for there because you're gonna just be living in perpetual fear if you live there. You've gotta transcend your need for, connection, or for security, connection, and control. And the only way you do it, Jesus said, is by not looking for those things. He says, if you want security, connection, and control, you've gotta seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all that stuff you're looking for will, will materialize. And you're like, whoa, that's a, how do I know it will materialize? Well, that's where faith comes in. You have to trust that, yes, if I stop, because here's the thing, if you're looking for security, connection, control, it's gonna make your world really small. You ever met people that are, their world is just so small? They're just so, we're worried about so petty, small things. Their own, their own protection. You're like, what's wrong? Well, they're living in fear. But, but, but here's the thing. When God's love comes into your heart and he becomes the source of your security, connection, control, he immediately starts to expand who you are because God knows who you are and what he made you to be. And that's where the call shows up. You start going, I think there's more in me than this. I just know it. And you may be even in the middle of doing self-destructive things, but you're still going, I just, I just know I've got more in me. I'm better than this. That's what Paul talks about. He says this first, he says this, listen, if we're out of our mind, if it seems like we're crazy, as some say, it's for God. If we're in our right mind, it's for you. For Christ's love compels us. And you know, when God's love comes into your heart and he starts expanding the capacity for who you can be, you start doing things that you never would have thought you'd be doing. And people start looking at you and going, hold up. You know, you say, nobody's ever going to use me like that again. You get out of a bad relationship and nobody's ever going to use me like that again. And then you come to Christ and, and you're like, God, just use me. And people start going, wait a second, you said you don't ever want to be used again. Now you're asking for God to use you. Yeah, it's like, because you know why? Because God's love, it, it always expands. It, always, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And when his love is in your heart, he begins to expand. And it says he compels you forward. And you know how he compels you forward? Into these circles that keep expanding bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and this is one of the things that, that John talks about that love. He says, listen, see what kind of love the father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. Right now, you are a child of God. And here's what he says. The reason why the world doesn't know us is that it did not know him. When God's love starts pushing you to be more than you can be, people start going, who do you think you are? Don't you know where you're from? We don't do that kind of thing. People like us don't do that. You think you're better than us? And you're like, no, I just, I just there's something in me that says there's more in me. And you, and, and, and it's God driving you outward, but people start to think you're arrogant. They're like, well, people of our color don't do that. People from Seguin don't do that, bro. <laughs> but you're like, I know, but I feel like I'm supposed to do this. And so, so people start thinking you're a little bit weird because Christ's love is compelling you outward. And here's the thing, beloved, he says, right, we are God's children right now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Now, this is what's fascinating about this circle thing, okay? At every moment in the circle of growth and every season that God is taking you to, you must accept where and who you are right now. Now, this is good news when we're in Christ because right now in Christ, you have the fullness of God's righteousness living in you. When he looks at you, when God looks at you, you're justified. That is a big theological term. It just means it's just as if I'd never sinned. He doesn't see all your mess ups, your mistakes. All he sees is Jesus Christ and the perfection of Jesus himself living inside of you. And that's a beautiful thing. And you need to start to see yourself with God's eyes, who he says you are. Well, I couldn't be worthy of that. You aren't worthy of that. But because of Jesus, he's made you worthy. So you say you're disqualified. Who, who are you to say you're disqualified? Jesus says you aren't. You better than Jesus? You think you're better than Jesus, right? <laughs> he says you've got what it takes living inside of you. So he said, right, at any given point, we have to recognize right now we're the sons and daughters of God. You must accept who you are and where you are. But here's the thing. Never sacrifice what you could be for who you are now. Right now, we're the sons and daughters of God, but this is just the beginning. It hasn't even been revealed what God wants to do in and through you. So don't settle right now. Now, here's, here's the lie the world will tell you, okay? There's this big popular movement right now. You just need to embrace yourself in all that you are. Embrace yourself for all you are. You're okay as you are. There's nothing wrong with you. And you go, 
uh, okay, but I feel really crappy about myself. I know me and I'm not that great. And people are telling you, well, you just accept yourself the way you are. And here's the thing. The lie is, if you just accept yourself the way you are apart from Christ, you are deluded and it's only going to lead to despair. But if you have Christ in you, you have a reason to accept yourself the way you are because yourself has now been fused with Christ. He has brought your spirit to life. And that's the tricky thing. The world, they like this part. It says, you just accept who you are, man. But what happens is when you start accepting who you are and say, well, I guess it's okay who I am, you start to get, fall into despair because you don't like who you are because you know you and I know me and I know the horrible things I think about my neighbors that what I want to do to them. <laughs> right? And you do too. But here's the thing. In Christ, we have a new identity. So the world says these things and they get it close. They're like, just accept who you are. But then people just fall into despair and discouragement because they're like, but I don't like who I am. I know there's more in me. And they're like, no, there's not more in you. Just accept who you are. You're great right now. And then you end up sacrificing who you could be for who you are right now. And that's one of the things a lot of times people are like, well, I don't like those people over there. They judge me. Well, are they judging you or is it they just see there's more in you than what you're living up to? And you're using the excuse, oh, they're judging me. Oh, maybe they just really love you. And they're like, dude, you got way more in you than what you're doing right now. Well, you're judging me. You should accept me as I am. Well, no, because as you are, it's pretty destructive right now. No, they see what's in you. Jesus never lets you stay the same. His love, when it comes into your heart, compels you outward and says, you got more in you than this, man. You can do more. So you've, you, can, you don't ever sacrifice what you could be for who you are now, you've got to step forward into the unknown. Now, here's the thing about it. The unknown is a scary place. What you could be is a scary thing. Because to get there, God has to take you through a process of refining you and strengthening you and building you who, into who you, who you can be. We're going to talk next week about how the challenges actually make us stronger. What doesn't kill us actually makes us stronger. But what happens is we get caught in fear. In fact, some of the fears, they look like this. Some of the fear would go, well, okay, I feel like maybe there's more in me, but what if I try and fail? You know the cure for failure? The cure, you know how to get, get like a cure for failure. Never be afraid of failure again. It's to fail. Because when you fail, you realize, oh, I survived. And you're here still. If you're still here today and you failed, you survived. You say, well, I don't ever want to fail. Well, who does? Thomas Edison didn't want to fail. He failed thousands of times and I'm so thankful he did because all these lights up here wouldn't have happened if he hadn't have failed. He learned what doesn't work. Sometimes we have fear of failure that holds us back and maybe we get into analysis paralysis. We start Googling stuff and listen, there's some stuff you just shouldn't Google. You should just listen to the Lord and do it. It's good to get wise, but man, you can talk yourself out of something with the facts. But you know what? There's all sorts, all sorts of pos like things that you can't, there's all sorts of things you can't predict that are positive, just as many positives as negatives. And I've seen, man, when you get in line with what God's doing, the forces of heaven come behind you and think, do things you never thought you could have done. So fear of failure holds us back sometimes. Sometimes fear of being unqualified. When I first started leading outdoor expeditions, I would get emails from people that would write and they're like, who are you certified to lead outdoor expeditions through? And I'd be like, uh, God, like... And I'd write them back, well, I'm not certified. And they'd write me and they're like, well, I'm certified through the Outdoor Wilderness Experts of America Global International. And I'm like, well, that's cool. You leading anybody outdoors? Well, no. And I'm like, well, I got people lining up to come with me. Doesn't seem like your certification means much. Here's the thing. It's okay to get certified. It's good to get certified. But a lot of times God's going to call you to do stuff that you're going to go, well, I'm not qualified for that. And he's like, don't worry. I don't, qual I don't call the qualified. I I'm looking, I, I qualify the called. And if you'll step out and do it in faith, it's amazing what God will do. Now get training, right? Get yourself some education and training, but don't be sitting around waiting until you feel qualified because there will always be people telling you you're not qualified. Steve Jobs didn't have any certifications. If he would have waited around for somebody to qualify him, we would have never had the iPhone. The world might have been better for it. But anyway, <laughs> we never would have had that. Steve Jobs said, I'm not waiting around for somebody telling me I'm qualified. I'm going to do it. 
And if you're feeling a call to do something, sure, get certifications if you need them, but you better start moving forward without it, even if you don't have, if God's calling you to do something, you need to do it. Don't let that fear of being unqualified. Next one is timing. Well, once the kids are out of the house, once we've got so much money in the bank, and listen to me, God will often call you to do stuff at the worst possible time. Straight up. Final one, fear of looking foolish. Do you know what this actually is? I didn't write this word because everybody, nobody likes this word. This is actually pride. Who wants to look foolish? Nobody. But man, when you're beginning with something, you always are going to end up looking foolish. That's why Paul says, if we look like we're out of our mind, it's because Christ is compelling us forward. We look foolish with what we're doing, but we know that God is working through us to do what he's called us to do. And what happens is because there's so much fear, a lot of times we won't take the step. But God is merciful. And what he will often do, you know, a mother eagle, when it's time for her little baby eagles to fly, the mother eagle will start pulling the soft feathers out of the nest and the sticks that, are, that make up the nest start poking the eagle and the eagles get a little uncomfortable. Like, oh, oh. Because, you know, eagles aren't meant to hang out in nests. They're meant to soar. But when it's comfortable, it's hard sometimes. So what often God in his grace will do is make things really uncomfortable for you. And one of the things that when writing we call the inciting, it's called the inciting incident. The inciting incident is when all of a sudden things get really uncomfortable for the lead character and they get kicked out of the nest and they have to decide, are they going to rise up and face the unknown or are they going to cower? And here's the thing. A lot of this depends on how you see the situation, depends on what you decide to look at it as. And if you decide to look at it as an adventure, your mind will shift into, it literally neurologically will shift into exploration mode. And you'll be like, okay, I'm ready. Let's learn. What do we got? What do we got? But if you decide to see it as some sort of an inconvenience, a frustration, your mind will shift into victim mode. And when you're in victim mode, all you do is, all you can do is complain. Why did this have to happen to me? Instead of thinking, oh man, God must have a big plan for me because look what he put in front of me. This is a big challenge. And it all depends right here. How are you going to see it? You see, the, all you're looking at, if you're all you're looking at is the loss, what could have been, what was. I thought they were going to be with me forever. Why are they gone? I thought I'd have this job forever. How did, what happened? You're going to end up victim mode instead of saying, nope, hold up. Okay, the discomfort here, clearly God has something greater for me. He wants me to soar to newer heights. So he's just making it really uncomfortable for me. This favorite quote, uh, my favorite author is a guy named G.K. Chesterton. He said this, he said, you know, an adventure is only an inconvenience rightly considered. An inconvenience is only an adventure wrongly considered. What kind of perspective are you going to have when God says, all right, I got more for you. I'm going to allow something into your life that's going to be really uncomfortable to push you to the heights that I know that you can rise to and soar to. How are you going to see it? You're going to see it as an adventure and then your mind shifts in and goes, all right, exploration mode. I'm an explorer. Here we go. We're going to have an adventure. Or are you going to just sit around and complain and moan? This isn't fair that it happened to me. What are you going to do? Your perspective makes all the difference. But here's the thing. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure that you seek. The thing that God has for you is just on the other side of the thing that's scaring you the most to do. And that call that you're like, I know there's more in me. He's saying there is. And to get there, I'm gonna need you to walk into a whole new unknown place. Now, here's the thing. It won't actually be unknown because remember God works in circles. He's already prepared you for what's ahead you just didn't realize it. Everything that's happened to you has prepared you for what's ahead. He sent you a guide. In fact, Jesus, right before he left the earth, he said this. He said, guys, I've got a lot of stuff I want to share with you. There's some great things that you need to know, but you can't handle it right now. But here's the thing. I'm going to send a guy. He's going to guide you. The spirit of truth will come. He will guide you. He'll be your guide into all truth. And he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. And here's, what, here's the thing about this. The Holy Spirit wants to guide you. But this is what's tricky about it. There is no formula for life. There is only revelation. We want a formula. Well, what do I need to do? And we read books and they say, do this, do this. And you do that. And you're like, how come my life don't look like your life? I'm reading your book. Yeah, because here's the thing, you're unique. And there's patterns and there's, there's, there's principles you can learn that'll work in every situation. But if you're trying to be an exact replica of somebody else, it will never work. That's why comparison is such a bad thing to do. You look on Facebook at somebody's life and you're like, oh, why couldn't I have that? You don't, listen, you don't know their struggle. They don't know your struggle. You're unique, you're special. Your journey's gonna look different. And we wanna know, well, how do I get where I wanna go? Well, here's the thing. You won't get there with a formula, which is what religion is. 
Religion's a formula. Tell me what boxes I need to check to make God happy. And God's like, hey, it doesn't work that way, buddy. You need to follow me. And I'll guide you based on your unique wiring, your special calling. In fact, I love this quote by Carl Jung. He says this, he says, one of the main functions of organized religion is to protect people against the direct experience of God. People are afraid. We're afraid of talking directly to God. He's like, well, what if he's asked me to do something uncomfortable? He will. will. That's why we want a box. Well, just tell me the boxes I can check. I like boxes, right? He said, no, 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 no. Listen, there's no formula. What I'm going to do in your life is not what I did in his life. Now, there may be some, some similarities and you can learn from the stories of others, but you need to go directly to the source and the guide will show you where he's calling you to go. So if you're here this morning, you're saying, man, I just know there's more in me. This is what the pattern looks like. This is what the circle looks like. You start out here in the center in fear of not getting your security connection or control, but there's something in you, the call that says, hey, there's more in you. That self-destructive thing you're doing, you're better than that. I know you've had a lot of pain, but here's the thing. You need to transform that pain into taking on the adventure of a journey. And oftentimes he'll throw something in your way. He'll allow something into your path. And you get to decide, are you going to step up and say, bring on the adventure? Or are you going to sit and whine and complain and give in to your fear? Or if you turn and you say, okay, you know what? I don't know what God's calling me to do, but I want to make sure that I become all he has called me to be. Right now I'm the righteousness of God, but it hasn't even been revealed what I can be. There's no upper limits. So what you do is you have courage. And courage is just stepping one step at a time toward the thing you fear the most. It's the only way to beat fear is you just got to face the thing you fear. Fear doesn't ever go away, but it can lose its power over you as you step wisely and courageously one step at a time saying, Jesus, is this a step I'm supposed to take? Yep, yep. And you take the one step and you find you survive. And then you take another and another. And before you know it, you're walking through the darkness with confidence one step at a time. You take the courage and then all of a sudden the guide comes along and he's like, hey, I'm not going to ask you to walk through this by yourself. I'm going to lead you step by step. But it's little step at a time. When I, when I used to lead outdoor adventures around the world, I'd lead four-month backpacking teams on, in, in Asia and Central America. And at four months is a long time. And I'd have a lot of my team members go, hey, I need the full schedule for the trip. And I'd be like, eh, no, no. It's on a need-to-know basis. And they'd go, well, where are we going to be on X day? I'm like, nope, I'll tell you when you need to know. And the, the thing they didn't realize is I actually didn't know. I would buy a ticket. I'd buy a round trip ticket. I knew where we needed, where we would land and we need return to. But what I found was that God led us on the most amazing adventures when we left it up to him to lead us as we landed. So I made some plans, but I always kept them flexible because when we'd get there, he'd open a door and we'd go, oh, we need to go over here. And before I knew it, we were working our way all around Asia, different ministries, seeing different opportunities. We worked our way through Central America. And you know, that's the way God leads us. He knows the plan now. Don't get me wrong, but it's on a need to know basis. And you just need to trust him. He's got the plan. He's leading and guiding you. But you've got to have the courage, first of all, to trust him. Second of all, to step out into the unknown and and, and shift your perspective, recognizing this thing that's come into my life, the diagnosis, the health diagnosis that you've realized your life's never going to be the same. Are you going to sit around and complain about it? Or are you going to say, all right, God, this is an inconvenience, but I'm going to look at it as an adventure. The situation, the relationship. Yeah, your husband left, your wife left. What are you going to do about it? You're going to sit around and come up with theories and lead to despair? Or are you going to say, nope, we're moving forward into the future. I know God hasn't abandoned me. He's still with me. I don't know what he's doing, but I'm going to be wise. I'm going to walk forward with courage. You're sitting there and you're saying, man, I've got this good job. It's providing for the family, but I feel like God's calling me to take a risk and step out and start this business. Be wise, get some counsel. But if God's calling you to do it, pursue the call as he puts the path in front of you. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.